This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, but gold still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people who have hold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman Pope rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome's sweet lie with fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. A sovereign God give faith to man. Salvation's in the Maker's hand. This gospel offends Rome today. They offer up another way, a counterfeit. A compromise, beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello everybody and welcome to a new broadcast from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth Today we have uh, the 2nd of November. I don't know when I will upload this, but probably not in so far the future. And it's quite some time since you've heard me making an, a new broadcast on Hour of the Truth, except for the two recorded ones that are already a few weeks old with Robert Newman. And also it is some time ago that I've had a guest on my Hour of the Truth, but um, I had uh, recently the opportunity while reading uh, a new book in one of the chapters to have as guest on um, my wonderful Christian friend Tom Fress from Inquisition Update who also supported me in reading chapter 7 of Behind the Dictators that you can look up in the playlist Behind the Dictators of the book reading that I did there chapter 7 the greatest Trojan horse of them all we were doing a show there together of uh, of that uh, sadly due to technical uh, interference an hour and a half is missing and so it is only two hours long <laughs> it would have been almost four hours long if everything would have been recorded without any mistake but um, I took on to read another book I read this in German and in English and when I was at chapter 19 uh, I saw the opportunity to ask Tom to come on and read that with me because that chapter was called, uh, let me have a look here, chapter 19, it was called Bible Prophecy and Bible Versions. Quite interesting and I knew that um, Tom would have much to participate in that chapter, but he is so busy with personal stuff um, that for the last month it is not possible for him to do his broadcasts on Inquisition Update, neither on First Amendment Radio nor regularly to visit me on Hour of the Truth or any other show to do things together even though we have many things planned together that we wanted to do. <coughs> now it's some time ago 
that Tom told me that he received an email. Sometimes, uh, not as often as he wants to, but sometimes he receives email. And, um, you know, when I put uh, videos up in um, the playlist Inquisition update with all the uh, all the videos that I take from Tom as, as much as I can to get the message out, um, <coughs> I always put the email address in there, tom at cwaves.us, where you can contact him and... Um, and ask questions or uh, discuss things with him. So he got uh, a, a, an email from one of his listeners asking him, uh, him a little bit about what they are and uh, about what, what he is generally and here and there uh, also making some suggestions like uh, that he is influenced by the SDA and, and, and things like this and uh, Tom is a very, very correct person and that when he receives an email like that, he sits down sometimes even for hours and responds. And uh, his response, I, I will not, I will not uh, read to you the email of the listener to Tom, but I will read to you the answer that Tom sat down for hours to uh, write to that person. It doesn't matter who that person is. Because the point is that when you are listening to what I read here, that is actually Inquisition updates or Tom Fress's message that he has to the world. And I think that it is quite a interesting message and an int uh, a message at least that interesting to make a whole hour of the truth show on that. <coughs> Why? Because a lot of the things that people um, allege Tom of or not not a ledge. There's a better word to say that um, that they accuse Tom of um, are a lot of things that I am accused also. Me, Jörg, from our of the truth, and uh, Tom and I we have a lot in common, even though that we are <laughs> miles away in our research because he has uh, done this for so much longer than I have been doing it. But that's not the point. Um, you know, uh, the 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 point is that uh, he loves the research that he does. I love the research that I do. I love my work. He loves his work, and we both love to work for the Holy Spirit. That's first and for all the thing that we ha we are working for. You know, and um, of course there are so many different denominations out there. Christianity is split in so many different ways that there are very often people who make allegations against other Christians, whether they are founded on facts or not, it doesn't matter, or sometimes they are just thoughts that they say. And there are sometimes people who want to put you to an agenda to, to actually do something that they want you to do. Like, for example, uh, they want to drag you into discussions on, for example, uh, give me your opinion on that person or on, on that YouTube channel or on that author or on that truther. Uh, I don't know names now and I, I, I'm very, very much aware of why I am not doing that. You can fill in the gaps for yourself. Or even like a discussion on the flat earth or round earth or whatever, you know, I mean discussions um, where, where these people try to drag you into something and work for their agenda instead for the agenda of the Holy Spirit. That is something Tom refuses to do and that is something I refuse to do. I have read a few books in the last time since I've become a Christian and uh, since I'm doing this work and I'm reading these books and for the latest, latest time I'm reading books in German as well as in English and then putting them together up as videos, the same chapters, that's with the next book that's going to come out, that will be uploaded chapter by chapter, English and German simultaneously, because I read the German version and the English version of the same book, and it was a very interesting experience for me, and uh, I've done that book completely, and now I'm already with the next one, starting in a few days, so... But the point is, that is my agenda, like Tom has his own agenda. And Tom has a very important message to the world. And this message is put into an email answer that he answered one of his listeners, 
who wrote him some time ago, and he thought that uh, that listener required an answer. So he sat down and <coughs> wrote what I'm going to read to you. And there is, of course, a lot in that what I'm going to read to you that you will probably understand uh, that way. Um, there is a lot of what I read to you that is not only fitting for Tom in Inquisition Update, but that's also fitting for me because I have the same point of view or sometimes even here and there the same experience, even though that I do not have that long experience. Tom succeeds me there for years and years because I'm just a baby Christian, as you know. <sighs> but not the quantity of years counts how long you believe in God. Well, the only thing that counts is that you believe in the right God. Huh? The, f the Father God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the creator of this world and our Savior Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son who died for us on the cross and uh, who seized this, uh, the sacrifices and oblations 2000 years ago according to Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Like Tom always likes to say. And I am of the same opinion. But anyway, like I told you, this person has made a few allegations against Tom and he is defying all these allegations in this email and I hope that you will enjoy me reading Inquisition Update's message to the world right now. First of all, I've made it abundantly clear to my listeners that I am not a Seventh-day Adventist nor am I associated with Seventh-day Adventist Church, nor is Nicholas Arthur, to my knowledge, nor is his First Amendment Radio, FAR, FAR group. Neither am I associated with any other host or group or sponsor on far First Amendment Radio. I belong to no organization, I belong to no secret society or any other human institution. I am a member of the body of Christ as founded and governed by him alone. I belong to no established church or so-called Christian denomination, and I am an indiscriminate critic of all the churches by whatever name. They have all gone astray, not just the Seventh-day Adventist. I believe that Alan G. White and others during those early years in the 1800s were purposely steered in the wrong direction regarding Bible prophecy by a Jesuit named Peter de Smet. And I will include a link on Wikipedia that you can read after who Jean Pierre de Smet, or Pierre Jean de Smet, Peter de Smet, shortly called in English, was. And also other Jesuits. The Jesuits have concertedly endeavored and succeeded in making fools of nearly all Bible-based Protestant or meaning non-Roman Catholic denominations. Is that not what the Jesuits swear to do when he ta when, uh, what, what the Jesuits swear to, swears to do when he takes his supreme oath of induction? Corrupting and destroying non-Roman Catholic Christian faith is their prime objective and they have succeeded, including Seventh-day Adventist. But that doesn't mean Seventh-day Adventist is wrong in all its teachings. Some of the best historicists and historians in the world today are Seventh-day Adventist authors and teachers. I will never repudiate their wonderful historical research just because they are SDA. Like with all so-called denominations, I eat the meat and spit out the bones. And by far, Seventh-day Adventist is not, among all the other so-called Protestant denominations, the one with the most bones to spit out. Let me assure you that. Now Tom continues about his personal life when he grows up, but everything that he said up to here about belonging to uh, any denomination, organization, society, secret or, or, or openly or whatever, church or whatever, is something that I take for myself too. But now we are going a little bit into Tom, his personal life, and he tells us a little bit about where he comes from. I grew up in a Pentecostal church, which did futurist teaching, and raised by a Pentecostal or futurist family, 
that remains Pentecostal Futurist still today. I later, as an emancipated married adult, voluntarily attended an independent King James Version Bible-based Baptist Church, the pastor of which taught me from the Schofield reference King James Version Bible, which is Jesuit Futurist to the bone both of which I now count as even more deceived and deluded than Seventh-day Adventists. And lest you perceive my previous comment to be a backhanded endorsement of Seventh-day Adventists, I share some of your views about Alan G. White and SDA. And I wager that I can even gainsay you against SDA. Because of Jesuit infiltration and corruption of all the non-Roman Catholic churches, I find peace in none of them. I only hope that fact doesn't offend you even more than your erroneous suspicion that I am a closet SDA. But years of experience has taught me that any follower of Christ alone, through the scriptures alone, whoever he may be, is an offense to all, if not most. On your question regarding the papacy's all-controlling role and ultimate sole responsibility for the establishment of the modern nation-state called Israel, and here I want to make a little side note that you have to watch the video from Tom Press on the subject that is to be found in the playlist Inquisition update called The Truth Behind the Nation State of Israel, when you want to understand what he talks about here in this letter. He continues, you first must understand who the Antichrist of Scripture and prophecy and history is. There is but one candidate in all the world once one studies papal history and compares it with Scripture. That is the primary occupation of Inquisition Update. Studying papal history and compare it with Scripture is the primary occupation of Inquisition Update and also of Hour of the Truth. I read that diabolical history, nearly 2,000 years of it, and compare it with what the King James Version Bible says about the little horn, the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the harlot, the whore, the one who is drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, the one who wears out the saints of the Most High, and the one who deceives the whole world, the one who reigneth over the kings of the earth, the Antichrist and other such like terms. It's a dead ringer. The papacy of the Roman Catholic Church is indeed the Antichrist and there's no other person or institution in the history of the world that even comes close. It's difficult to come to the wrong conclusion if there is but one answer to the question. God made it just that easy for us all. Keep in mind that most so-called biblical teachers or so-called historicists work an agenda that teaches in no words Rome as being the Antichrist. And God made it easy for us to see. God, by the scriptures, made it virtually impossible for anyone, especially a Jew who was well read in the scriptures, to miss Jesus, to miss Jesus the Christ, our Messiah, his only begotten Son, when he came about 2,000 year ago, years ago. See the law and all the prophets and the Psalms collectively and erroneously called the Old Testament as though it should be discarded, and especially Daniel chapter 9. And likewise, God made it equally impossible for his people to miss the Antichrist, the counterfeit of Christ, the deceiver of the whole world when he came. Yet, despite all the details describing the Messiah and the law and the prophets and the Psalms, and especially Daniel's 70th week prophecy that gives the precise timing of the coming of Messiah, the scripture clearly says of the Jews that they, quote, knew not the time of their visitation, unquote. Likewise, the Protestants of today can't tell you who the Antichrist is or even when he came. And just as the Jews slew their own Messiah, the Protestants of today are prepared to accept a false Christ, the Antichrist of Scripture and History, the Papacy. Albert, 
Let me ask you if I do all my, uh, as I do all my listeners, a legitimate and all important question. Why would an all holy God leave his people without a shred of doubt about his son? And then leave us any doubt at all about who his son's diabolical counterfeit is? Would God redeem us through his son's death? and then leave us wide open to be deceived and damned? What God calling himself holy would deal so treacherously with those very ones for whom he sacrificed his, his own son to redeem? Well, the obvious fact is he did not. Nor would he think to do such a thing. Would he allow his saints to be deceived by the Antichrist, as is so universally supposed today? Would he allow his son to die in vain? Or would he instead use his blood, bought saints throughout the ages, to warn the world about who the Antichrist is? Well, the answer is obvious, eh? Exposing the Antichrist is literally one of God's positively identifying marks upon his people. God's people throughout the Christian era have always known who the Antichrist is and have universally suffered persecution and torture and death for proving it beyond any credible doubt. On Inquisition Update, I, just like all my spiritual predecessors throughout the Christian era, make it so vividly clear and certain who and what the Antichrist is as to leave absolutely no room for doubt in any honest, undeceived mind. Virtually, there is not even a close competitor to the papacy for the role of Antichrist. Only Jesus fulfilled every single prophecy in the Bible about the Messiah and Lamb of God. There is not another candidate for the role of Christ. Likewise, only the papacy fulfills every single prophecy in the Bible about the Antichrist. Full stop! God does not deal treacherously with his blood, bought sons and daughters, nor does he despise the blood of his only begotten son. To say or to suppose otherwise is to blaspheme his holy name. Secondly, one must understand why Satan's vicar on earth, Christ's diabolical counterfeit, the Antichrist, the papacy, would desire a modern nation state of Israel today. What is his motive. From the very beginning of the papacy, there were, and still are, and always have been, and will be, multitudes in the world who read the scriptures and compared them with history. They understood that, properly, all true prophecy, found only in God's holy word, the King James Version of the Bible, is history told in advance going to read that sentence again because that really needs to sink in. They understood that properly all true prophecy found only in God's holy word, the King James Version of the Bible, prophecy is history told in advance. When God through one of its prophets foretells something, you can rest assured that the obvious and precise fulfillment of that prophecy will be found in history. And the King James Version of the Bible describes in intricate detail almost every aspect of the papacy throughout its history. The Word of God is so precise in its description of the papacy as the Antichrist that many of the monks and nuns and theologians and hierarchy of that church throughout its history came to the right conclusion and declared publicly that the papacy is the Antichrist. Therefore, the papacy created the Inquisition to silence all accusers of the papacy within that church. The papacy also forbids the reading of the scriptures without explicit authorization and guidance by the papacy and its priestly hierarchy. When that failed to silence all the growing number of Roman Catholic accusers, the Inquisition was called out to burn all Bibles. When that failed to silence the accusers, the Inquisition was summoned to burn Bibles and Bible readers along, to the tune of tens of millions of the saints. Remember the song in the beginning on Hour of the Truth? 
And when the Bible began to be translated into all the languages of the world, the majority view became that indeed the papacy was and is and always will be the Antichrist of the Bible. That belief became the foundation of the Protestant Reformation and led nearly all of Europe and its people and its governments to rebel against the papacy. The Protestant Reformation view of the papacy as the Antichrist became so universally believed that the papacy was left nearly desolate. It had no more control of priests, nor kings, nor peoples, nor nations, and its coffers were nearly empty, and the popes were left without subjects or power or influence in the world. From all apparent perspectives, the papacy was dead. But Satan raised him up again, out of the bottomless pit. How, you ask? Here's how to regain and preserve its former self-proclaimed status as quote-unquote the vicar of Christ and quote-unquote king of kings and lord of lords and to shed the onus of Antichrist as so widely believed and taught in the Protestant era, the papacy instructed that alternative interpretations of Bible prophecy be devised that would tend to exclude the papacy from the role of Antichrist. They found two such twisted alternatives of prophetic interpretation. One was called Preterism, which asserted that the Antichrist was Antiochus Epiphanes, a Greek no less, <coughs> or Nero, a Roman Caesar, or Caligula, a Roman Caesar, or any and all the Roman Caesars collectively. Remember, it wasn't as important to identify the one true Antichrist as much as it was necessary to exonerate the papacy, the true Antichrist. Preterism also asserts that, since the Roman Caesars were the Antichrist, then the papacy, which replaced the Caesars, must be the true vicar of Christ after all, and that, moreover, it is the destiny of the papacy to erect in the world the quote-unquote kingdom of Christ, and to rule the entire world in Christ's absence. That is precisely what the papacy has been trying to do from its very beginning and has at this date nearly accomplished, as is apparent from Rooney's book, The Global Vatican, that Tom first read in 2015, and you can follow the readings of that in the playlist of Inquisition Update uh, in, in the playlist on the channel of First Amendment Radio. And uh, I also have a playlist of videos uploaded on Vimeo where you can watch that. The Global Vatican. But, Tom continues, but that twisted alternative of Bible prophecy, preterism, was weak. In that the Bible makes it certain that the, quote, man of sin, unquote, does not appear until after the restrainer is taken out of the way. Those who read and understood, who read and understood the Bible and history, realized that that restrainer was none other than the Roman Caesars, and Paul was also very explicit about that. He who now letteth has to be taken out of the way. Read it for yourself in the King James version. And history produces the inarguable fact, inarguable that the power that rose up immediately in the vacuum left behind by the Roman Caesars was and is the papacy and none other. Truly, the King James Version of the Bible is the true word of God. The second alternative teaching of prophecy designed to shed the sticky onus of Antichrist away from the papacy is called Futurism. Unlike Preterism, which never really caught on, futurism is almost universally believed by quote-unquote Christians today. Futurism asserts that Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9, verse 23 through 27, commonly referred to as Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, which precisely dates the coming of the Messiah, Jesus, and his death three and a half years later in the midst of the 70th week, exactly three and a half years after his baptism by John the Baptist, who announced that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, which was confirmed by a voice from heaven, 
and the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, all of which was perfectly and completely fulfilled 2000 years ago, is not yet fulfilled. Futurism asserts that Daniel's prophecy mysteriously has within it a 2000 year gap in its timeline. And not only that, but it will be fulfilled not by Messiah Jesus 2000 years ago, but by a future Antichrist 2000 years later. You can't get more twisted than that. But the strong delusion called futurism is believed by nearly all who call themselves Christians today. And it is a direct contradiction of the original and unanimous Protestant belief and teaching. The modern-day belief in futurism asserts that all the martyrs of Jesus throughout the Christian era who gave their lives to warn the world that the papacy is the Antichrist, literally hundreds of millions of the saints of God, were wrong and that they all died in vain. Worse than that, that they were a hindrance and a rubber of Christ, meaning the Pope's kingdom. Like I said, you can't get more twisted. Than that. Here's a source for you. Quote, the origin of dispensational futurism and its entry into Protestant Christianity from C. H. Martin. I'm holding a copy of it in my hand. A copy that I read verbatim and discussed voluminously on Inquisition Update a couple of years ago. But that's only one of many different sources that confirm that Futurism and Preterism are anti-Protestant, anti-Christ, anti-Bible deceptions created by the Jesuits. I've read and discussed many others on Inquisition Update over the years. Futurism is Jesuit teaching. It is uniquely Roman Catholic teaching. It is papal teaching because it exonerates the papacy from the onus of Antichrist and makes the Bible-based Protestant Reformation a crime against the self-styled quote-unquote vicar of Christ on earth. Worse, according to the papacy, the true Antichrist, the Protestant Reformation, the belief that the papacy is the Antichrist, was a diabolical and devastating hindrance to the divine establishment of the global kingdom of Christ under the papacy, now clandestinely referred to as, quote-unquote, the New World Order by popes and kings and presidents alike. Futurism is anti-Protestant teaching. Futurism is anti-Bible teaching. Futurism is single-handedly destroys Bible-based Protestantism because Futurism sheds the onus of Antichrist away from the papacy. And the belief that the papacy is the Antichrist is the very definition of Protestantism. Futurism demands that the papacy is now the legitimate representative and replacement of God on earth and it should be restored to global authority and supremacy and that all who opposed it, Protestant and Protestant nations that is, should be directed to restore him to his rightful global throne at their own expense or they be destroyed. That is precisely what is happening before the eyes and ears of the world, yet it remains clueless. Futurism literally but indirectly denies that Jesus was the Messiah, meaning Daniel's 70th week is not yet fulfilled, therefore Jesus was not the Messiah that Daniel prophesied to come, and that Messiah won't come until after 2000 years have transpired and Antichrist a phony one, by the way, is first revealed and destroyed. But the true Antichrist was indeed revealed nearly 2000 years ago, just as the Apostle Paul prophesied right after the fall of the Caesars, the restrainer and the collapse of the pagan Roman Empire, after which immediately rose up in its place the papacy, the one about whom Paul, the man of sin, and Daniel, the little horn, both prophesied. The Roman Catholic Church, 
the scarlet harlot with the golden cup in her hand, about which John the Beloved in Revelation 17 prophesied, and the holy papal Roman Empire that governed the world, the whole world, during the old world order, before the Bible-based Protestants seemingly destroyed it about 500 years ago. What a difference 500 years make! And let me remind you, dear listener and viewer of the video, today, on the 2nd of November, we are just two days past 31st of October. Did you all have a nice party on Halloween? I had a nice remembrance of Reformation Day, what that day actually resembles. What a difference 500 years make. Who remembers today that the 31st of October, 1517, Martin Luther started the Reformation in, on German ground, later on with his translation of the Bible, set more than 250 million Europeans free, free from the bondage of Rome. Who remembers that today? What a difference 500 years make. If the Protestant reformers could see what the Protestants believe today, they would turn in their graves, they would come out of their graves and stone them all. Antichrist futurism is believed by both Protestants and Catholics today. <laughs> That's why they can unite <laughs> through ecumenism. <laughs> Reunited in that Jesuit fabricated lie, the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden, the universal belief in futurism is the foundation upon which the diabolical ecumenical movement is built. The ecumenical movement, erroneously thought to be merely a religious movement for peace and unity among quote-unquote Christians, but which is strictly a political alliance for global conquest, a literal global holy Roman crusade as United Protestants and Catholics to, as United uh, has united Protestants and Catholics together the entire so-called Christian world into a religio-political military alliance bent on not only undoing the damage that was done to the papacy during the Protestant Reformation, but to conquer the rest of the world for the universal global reign of the papacy. Undoing the Reformation and winning the rest of the world for the reign of Antichrist is accomplished by the rich and powerful Protestant nations by conquering the whole world at their own expense, in treasure and in blood, by whatever means, fair or foul, and under whatever pretense, true or false, for the papacy. Being completely duped by Jesuit futurism, the Protestant nations especially Protestant America, are bearing the entire burden and cost, mostly spiritual cost, of restoring everything the papacy lost during the Protestant Reformation. Its power, its governance, its authority in both spiritual and temporal, meaning civil affairs, its incalculable wealth, and it restores the papacy to its original status as Vicar of Christ and King of Kings and Lord of Lords. First futurism, then ecumenism, then a global Vatican. Did you get that? First futurism, starting 1590 with Francisco Ribera, then ecumenism, going into the hard way from the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, then a global Vatican. That's probably why Francis Rooney wrote that book just a few years ago. A new world order. That's not new at all, but simply the restoration of the old world order, this time on a global scale. Universal global denial of the Bible and the equal rejection of Jesus Christ in favor of the Antichrist, the papacy. Is it any wonder the Bible says, quote, When I return, shall I find faith on the earth? Unquote. And, quote, As it was in the days of Noah, 
when only eight souls entered the ark and were saved, so shall it also be in the day of the coming of the Son of Man. Unquote. And, quote, the whole world wonders after the beast. Unquote. And endless other such like things in the scriptures. And is it any wonder that the new world order, meaning the re-establishment of the old world order under the papal Caesars, is being accomplished by woefully deceived and Jesuit-defeated Protestant nations? As unbelievable as it may sound, it is Protestant blood, it is Protestant treasure, and the Protestant soul that is being sacrificed to restore the Antichrist to global supremacy in the world and conquering all opposition wherever it may be found in the world to an unchallenged papal reign. Most find it unbelievable that the Jews killed their own Messiah 2000 years ago. But what about the Protestants today? <laughs> now, here's the specific answer to your question. In universal and express denial that Jesus was the Messiah and that he alone fulfilled Daniel's 70 years week prophecy perfectly and completely 2000 years ago, just as the New Testament and history confirms, and for Daniel's 70 week prophecy to have a future fulfillment absolutely requires a future nation state of Israel and a future Jerusalem and a future temple. Otherwise, a future false fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy is impossible and wouldn't be believed by a drooling infant child, let alone the entire quote-unquote Christian world. And what's the papacy's ultimate goal? First, to present to the whole world a false antichrist, anyone chosen by the papacy that can convincingly play the role either wittingly or even unwittingly, and then to present to the woefully deceived world a false messiah. The papacy, the biblical, historical and prophetic antichrist all along. None of it would be possible were it not for the diabolical genius of the Jesuits and their master deception, futurism. And none of it would be possible if the Protestants returned to the King James Version of the Bible and to the correct Protestant historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy as revealed and confirmed by history and a true and sincere love for Jesus Christ and his governance. Again, what is the Antichrist, meaning the papacy's ultimate motive in all of this? I repeat to present to the world an aggressor that will destroy the city, Jerusalem, and the sanctuary, the rebuilt temple, in a phony counterfeit refulfillment of Daniel's 70 years week prophecy, see Daniel chapter 9. And then, once this man is destroyed, to present himself, the papacy, to the world as the true Christ and the lawful and indisputable King of Kings and Lord of Lords, literally God on earth. It is hoped by the papacy and the most powerful of the world's leaders that this grand deception will finally unite the world under the papacy's global government and rule and that it will never again be challenged or threatened, such as did all those hundreds of millions throughout history who read and who read and understood their Bibles and history, and who unerringly marked the papacy as the Antichrist and patiently suffered persecution and torture and martyrdom for their efforts to spare us all. It is hoped by the papacy, the Antichrist, Satan's vicar on earth, that this futurist grand deception, since it is so widely believed among deluded Christians today, will be the permanent end of Protestantism. For, after all, the basic elements of Protestantism are that, first, Jesus is the Christ who came 2000 years ago the Redeemer of man to God, the real King of Kings and Lord of Lords, who perfectly and completely fulfilled Daniel's 70-week prophecy precisely on time, and, second, 
that the papacy, the Antichrist of scripture and of history, is a diabolical, albeit vividly prophesied, to come counterfeit. Now do you understand why I call the papacy, quote, the greatest Zionist on the planet, unquote. Now do you understand why the papacy was the principal power behind the creation of the modern nation-state of Israel? If you can say yes to either or both of these questions, then by now you can describe to me the real motive behind the major wars of the world. You can also describe to me why Jews were slaughtered and persecuted by Roman Catholic Hitler and Jesuit Himmler and the entire Nazi Roman Catholic hierarchy. After all, a phony re-fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week and the presentation of the papacy as sweet Christ on earth wouldn't be possible without Jews fleeing to their ancient Israel and making animal sacrifices in a rebuilt Jewish temple in a Jewish Jerusalem, would it? It's absolutely imperative for the survival of Satan's vicar, the papacy, that this grand delusion, a phony refulfillment of Daniel's 70th week, be accomplished in believable fashion before the Protestants wake up to the futurist delusion. Otherwise, the papacy will be utterly destroyed and will never accomplish its satanic destiny to rule the earth, Jesus Christ's promised inheritance. The papacy and the governments of the most powerful nations on earth realize this. A new protestant voice, albeit barely a whisper at this time, is being raised up in the world. A return to the protestant interpretation of prophecy is being realized. The papacy and his global government are again in jeopardy if they don't f act fast. Global chaos is even then imminent. Satan and his vicar on earth, the papacy, the antichrist of scripture, knows that he hath but a short time. And toward whom will Satan and his vicar direct this wrath and chaos? As in all generations of the Christian era, against the saints of the Most High. Because they alone are fearless and faithful witnesses for Christ and against Antichrist. Albert, the only reason why you have not heard me cite sources regarding the papacy's principal role in the establishment of the modern nation-state of Israel is because you obviously are a brand new listener and not well acquainted with me or Inquisition Update or the direct sources that I read every morning right on the air. I love to hear from new listeners. Thanks for taking the time to listen and to write. And if it's sources that you need, then sources you will get. It is those very sources that I read verbatim and discuss at length on Inquisition Update. I read those sources directly from hard copy books right here in my study. Rooney's The Global Vatican was only one of what, what, of what by now must be nearly 100 books that I've read and discussed on Inquisition Update over the years many of which, like the Global Vatican, were Roman Catholic sources, and not Protestant sources. The next book that I read and discussed on Inquisition Update was Rome and Civil Liberty by James Aitken Wiley. I highly recommend that you listen to that reading and discussion. Also, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R. W. Thompson, and my favorite, but I have so many, Romanism and the Reformation, by Henry Gretton Guinness. And a little insertion from me, Jörg, on Hour of the Truth here. Romanism and the Reformation is a book every Bible-believing Christian next to the Bible should have read. And Tom's reading that he did in a discussion group with uh, Walt Stickel some years ago is now being uploaded part by part on my channel. And just today, on the 2nd of November, I uploaded part 10 and there are a little bit over 30 when it is complete. Tom reads and discusses that book, Romanism and the Reformation, from Henry Gretton Guinness, published in 1887. And I want to advise anybody of my listeners here to make sure that you watch these videos 
of that reading or you just go to uh, the link that is provided in the description box of the videos where you can listen to the original mp3s and then you can even do that in completion before I uh, uploaded all the parts on my channel. But I absolutely advise everyone to read Romanism and the Reformation and not only to read that book but the best way to understand that book is to listen to Tom's reading and discussion of the book. But he continues, These are only a few of literally dozens of other books that I've read and discussed on Inquisition Update on this subject alone. Albert, I have sources, a veritable library of sources. And I don't just quote them or cite them. I read them all in their entirety, unedited, verbatim. I let my sources speak for themselves every morning. Many of my sources are the popes themselves from their own writings and pastoral letters and encyclicals and decrees and papal bulls. You may already be overwhelmed by the information presented here in this short email. Trust me, I've only scratched the surface. For a full understanding, keep listening to Inquisition Update. Catch up by listening to the archives. I've been doing Inquisition Update for nearly a decade now. Until I hear from you again, peace and blessings in the name of the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2000 years ago, Jesus Christ, our Messiah and Lamb of God, the true and only King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. This brings this show this broadcast on Hour of the Truth to almost 50 minutes and um, I think it was quite important to get that message from Inquisition Update to the world out. I don't know if I use that title or maybe use a title like Daniel 9 or Greatest Deception Since the Garden of Eden Part 2 or whatever. I'll see which title I use. But the point is that every word that Tom read here, uh, that Tom wrote here, is uh, absolute truth and can be verified against the Word of God, against the Bible. But before I'm going to finish this, because he was using, of course, a lot of uh, the term Protestants, I want to read you a little bit from my last book reading what they are saying or how is a protestant described in here. Just a very little excerpt. Those who follow Christ as his disciples, sinners saved by grace, believe in the power of prayer. Scripture confirms their belief. Quote, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Unquote, as we can read in James chapter 5, verse 16. They know that they have been redeemed through the shed blood of Christ and born again of His Spirit. They believe that Christ came to die for them so that they might live entirely for Him. The wonderful assurance of salvation is the very basis of their lives. That, among other points, is how you identify a protestant. And I want to end with a very important sentence, in my opinion, in that case. The Protestants at that time, surely Luther, said and proclaimed the Bible and the Bible alone. Sola Scriptura. Okay? If the Protestants held to that there would not be 30,000, not even be 3,000, 300, not even 30, no, not even three different Protestant denominations. There would be one Protestant movement that protests the Antichrist of Scripture, of the one Scripture, the Bible. But personal interpretation and 
I am sorry to say, teachings of men caused diversion within the Protestant Reformation. It can never be a group that reveals it all. It can only be single people, individuals. It always have been individuals throughout history. The apostles have been individuals. A lot of the saints have been individuals. They never worked in big groups. They were individuals. They stood for their... Um, they stood for their conviction that the Bible and the Bible alone is the authority of their conscience. The Word of God is the authority of their conscience. No compromise and no falling away from it. And when you find that again and you understand that there is the only Antichrist in this world that is the one that is identified by the Bible, by the Word of God, and you understand that, and you are going to pronounce that everywhere you go, then you can call yourself a protestant. And otherwise, you are probably just an ecumenical, quote-unquote, Christian. I'm sorry, but that's the way the cookie crumbles. Jogna 66 from Hour of the Truth says, God bless you. Signing off. Until next time. Bye-bye.